All right. So welcome. We got a. All right. Ready? If you're a nature loving science nerd, we think that you just find be happy like us to start Nebraska nature nerd night. Turtles, fish, and vertebrates, disease, and fungi too. If you're a curious brainiac, we got a show for you. I see some of our guests who haven't been here before just like laughing. <laughs> Randy's like, what did I do in Nebraska? What did I sign up for? <laughs> we forgot to tell you. That was part of it, Randy. <laughs> Thanks right. so much for joining us, everyone. Um, welcome to our last Nebraska Nature Nerd Night for the year. Tonight's topic is carnivore ecology. So we're so excited. We're going to dive into the world of carnivores. Um, they contribute to healthy ecosystems. They fill that role of predator and food webs. And we're going to learn both about their ecology from today in the present, but also dive into the past and how carnivores of the past shaped our landscapes here in Nebraska in the Great Plains. So we have two amazing speakers here with us tonight, some awesome nature nerds that are going to help us have this conversation. Yeah, so like Amber says, we're going to be talking about past and present. So our past carnivore expert is going to be Shane Tucker, who is the highway paleontologist for the University of Nebraska State Museum. And he's actually been on with us before. Mm -hmm. Last year, he talked to us about some prehistoric creatures that were in Nebraska. And then for our present day carnivore ecology, um, we have an out-of-stater that actually joined us. So Randy Johnson, um, he's a large carnivore specialist with the Wisconsin Department Department of Natural Resources. So if any of you are familiar with Sam Wilson, who's our Nebraska Game and Parks carnivore person, he is the kind of equivalent to Sam in Wisconsin. So very knowledgeable and welcome Shane and Randy tonight. So thank you. Very excited. Are we ready to get started? Yes. Okay. So the, the first thing we always like to ask um, our, our guests is we just want to know what made you a nature nerd and specifically maybe tonight, um, what made you a nature nerd and what has drawn to you to carnivores? Randy, would you like to go first? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, I guess the short and sweet answer for me is I, I just grew up doing a lot of outdoor stuff. I've always been outside, whether it's camping or hunting or whatever, and just always found myself drawn to exploring and being outside. And and especially the carnivores are, you know, what really drew my attention. Um, maybe even from an early age, I've just always been fascinated by the carnivores and the predators and just these these animals that are less abundant on the mm -hmm. landscape, but they're really charismatic. And as I got further into realizing what I wanted to do and into my career, I started to also realize that, you know, when it comes to wildlife research, we know a lot about ducks and deer and some of those species, mm -hmm. but a lot of the carnivores, we, there's a lot more to be learned yet. And that was really appealing to me. That's great. Thanks, Randy. Shane? And for me, very sim similar to, to Randy, being outside a lot as a kid, and, uh, the carnivores are always very secretive and always feels, you know, when you see one, like you've actually spotted something. Whereas a deer, you can go around, they're everywhere, you know, inside of the room. When I came to the University of Nebraska to study paleontology, I started to look at some of the fossil species that were present. Many of those were extremely interesting, you know, things that would definitely kill a human if we were around at the same time when they were alive. And then on top of that, for my master's degree, I focused on studying the carnivores from a six million year old site. And at that particular site, we had 17 different species of carnivores living six million years ago. And several of them are things that came over from Asia. And um, that's the most diverse site, the 17 carnivores that six million years ago makes it the most diverse carnivore fauna uh, from sites of that age anywhere in North America. So it's extremely- Are you serious? Is this in Nebraska? Exciting. Here in Nebraska, yeah, at that six yeah, million- He's always people. dropping these things. I know, look at that, that's so cool. That's super cool, Shane. We're not boring. No, no. Nebraska is- Nebraska is never forever. boring, never yeah. boring. <laughs> Nebraska's for everyone. Okay, I, I always have to say that. Um, That is so cool. What a great backstory for both of you guys. Can you, you wanna share with us maybe what your current role is and how that currently coincides with carnivore ecology. Cause I know Randy, you're more of a specialist in this. Shane, you have broader interests than just carnivores, but yeah, tell us about your current role. Yeah, so um, I got my undergraduate in wildlife uh, management through South Dakota State University. And then I did my master's degree there as well. And my master's was focused on cougars in Western North Dakota. So, uh, pretty well versed in the cougar world, uh, which is very applicable to Nebraska, which I'm sure we'll get into. 
Um, I worked for a while in South Dakota as a wildlife biologist and then came here a few years ago and yeah, specialized in a, in a carnivore position. So I, I'm focused on statewide management of our wolf population, mm -hmm. our black bear population, and then the occasional cougar that uh, wanders over here as well. Excellent. And, and for me, I, uh, my training is as a geologist with my specialty in vertebrate paleontology, specifically mammalian paleontology. Uh, but I do have minor in biology. And uh, when I'm out doing my normal job, I'm the state's highway paleontologist. So we go monitor active construction projects and excavate any fossils. And although they're less abundant than the herbivores, carnivores do turn up quite frequently. And they're usually pretty cool and interesting. So there's been several projects where we have carnivores. There's lots of research projects on carnivores that I'm either working on now or would like to continue working on in the future. So um, there is a substantial component of those ancient faunas. They sometimes tell us a lot about like what the landscapes look like alongside with their herbivores. So they're extremely interesting. So that's kind of um, my role uh, with carnivores today. Awesome. Well, before we dive into which species we have here in Nebraska, let's talk a little bit about kind of like a basic. So carnivore 101. Carnivore 101. Mm -hmm. What is a carnivore? Is that the same thing as a predator? Uh, what are the, the differences between them? What's carnivore? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, basically a carnivore is, I guess, a meat eater, generally speaking. It's an organism that consumes other animals, um, most of which are animals. Um, and so that would be, you know, a, a predator, but we do have, you know, for example, carnivorous plants, mm -hmm. like, uh, Venus flytrap is a carnivorous plant. I think pitcher plants are as well. Um, so just generally speaking, like a predator would be, um, you know, a, a, a broader term, I would say for a, 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 an animal or a, an organism, I should say that, that takes and consumes other uh, organisms. Carnivorous is more focused on what are they eating, meat eaters, mm -hmm. whether that's animals or plants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, scavengers, like you can have vultures too that kind of fit into here as well, where they're a, a carnivore, they're eating meat from dead animals, but they're not a predator because they're not actually killing them. They're so, not hunting, maybe. Right, yep. yeah. Okay, that's so good. let's hear a little bit more about carnivores, because the first thing I think of when I think of a carnivore is like a mountain lion, mm -hmm. a bear. Um, are there other carnivores? You kind of touched this a little bit, Randy, that are not mammals? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely there's birds, you know, birds of prey. So all of your owls, your your hawks and raptors, the vultures I mentioned. Um, we can talk about, um, you know, you look at fish, a lot of fish eat other fish and that would all be therefore a carnivore. Um, and then even within the mammals, you know, we, we think about the big ones, right? They get all of our attention. But things like coyotes, fox, um, you know, all the way down to like a weasel, which you know, weasels like the size of a hot dog. Like they're still, they're still uh, uh, carnivores. So a lot of diversity. That's excellent. And I think tonight, what we're gonna probably, what we're excited to dive into the most is probably the mammal type carnivores. Yeah. And so that order of carnivora and thinking about all those critters, both that live here in Nebraska and the Great Plains now and in the past. Yes. Yeah. So let's see what, um, maybe I've, I saw them both having some really cool skulls. Yeah. Can we get into a little carnivore anatomy 101? And I know that both of you guys have some really great specimens um, to share. Maybe um, a good question that I've, I've um, heard a lot before is <coughs> like maybe the difference between uh, like the wolves and the cat skulls or the bear skulls. Those are the big three that I've, yeah, that we kind of yeah. think what about are the differences in their anatomy and their shapes and. I think I can help with that. Randy's on it. Shane, I know you've got some too. All the big stuff, which is awesome. I want yeah. to see it too. So let me try to hold this up so you can see it. So I guess, let me just start. We'll start with the wolf. So this is a gray wolf skull. I'll kind of hold it up here so you can get an idea of the size. And I actually have a coyote skull as well. So coyotes are very Thank common you. across Nebraska. They're both a canine, right? They're both dog species. So very similar in their teeth, uh, very similar in their, their, you know, overall, largely just the size difference. Um, but when we're talking about canines, we're talking about dogs, right? So a few things to point out, one of which is this really big 
um, ridge across the top. That's where your your jaw muscles attach. Right? That's a good and old so, sagittal crest. Sagittal crest, exactly. So that's an indication that these guys have a big bite force. There's a big muscle that, you know, and wolves in particular can chew through ribs and femurs and things like that. So a lot of bite force. The other thing that's worth pointing out right away is they have a lot of investment in their nose. There's a mm. lot of space here. There's a lot of tissue. So they live, you know, by their nose. The opposite of that would be the cat skull. So this is a cougar. Cougars are in Nebraska. We can talk more about that later. But one of the things right away you see is the investment is not in their nose. I'll hold that so you can see it. But it's instead in their eyes. Yeah, look at that. So if you see cougars, they have huge space dedicated to their eyes, forward facing. So cats, and if you have a house cat at home or a dog for that matter, you know this already. No, dogs are running around following their nose. Cats follow their eyes. Wow, yeah. And that's very apparent in their skulls. Um, they don't have quite the sagittal crest here, um, but still they have a little bit different in that the whole skull is shorter. Mm. So they have still powerful bite force, but they don't need quite as much muscle just because it's more of a shearing force with the smaller jaw here. Mm -hmm. um, and then real quick, we'll go to bear. Bear is kind of a mix. I was it's just gonna say, they're like yeah. a mix between the two. They're kind of, in, yeah, they don't have a lot invested in their eyes, but they have a lot of, I mean, there's still a good chunk of nose there. Um, but in particular, their teeth are a little bit different in that, well, it's driven by the fact that bears have more of an omnivorous diet. Mm -hmm. Definitely eat uh, meat, but they're eating a lot of plant material as well. So uh, I don't know if I can maybe share that. I mean, that's the lower jaw of a bear. Okay. Almost more human-like, where it's got you know molars and and whatnot going on, whereas the wolf's got a lot more shearing uh, oh, teeth for yeah. <laughs> really meat. That's really cool. Oh, that's good. Shane, do you oh, have any um, in the cat? dog or bear variety of skulls. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we, we even have extinct families that aren't here today that are cat-like in appearance, like Nimravids, which are a cat-like thing. If I hold this um, particular skull up here in front of the screen here, um, like I said, the eyes in the front has a very short face, just like the cat does. But if we look at the front end, they have these very enlarged canine teeth that they mm. use on these, there's a, a many times a lot of serrations on the backside for these saber cats. So this is one that, that lived, um, it's an extinct group, um, it's an extinct family called the Nimravids that are cat-like. This is one that lived 36 million years ago um, that we could find in a particular layer of rock. And then I've got another one right here. Oh my gosh. Uh, which is a cast of a skull of, of a big Nimravid from, that's lion-sized, that lived roughly uh, six to eight million years ago in a different time frame, um, but an extremely large canine tooth. And we can look at these, these, these animals can open their mouth over 100, 100 degrees, and they would use that canine tooth for slashing into the neck of a prey item, maybe a horse or an antelope, um, maybe a rhino living at the different time frames. That's an extinct group. So we have these, these animals here, um, First, we see them in the fossil record in Nebraska from 36 million years ago to about 23. Mm -hmm. And then there's about a five million year gap where we don't, don't have any cat-like carnivores on the landscape. And then the Nimravids come back and then uh, also the true felids uh, come back. So here's a, here's a true cat. This is a skull of a jaguar that lived during the ice age. Once again, mm -hmm. shortened rostrum on the front end, large eyes investment. Uh, teeth for shearing uh, meat. Uh, we this see this was in Nebraska, Shane. Yeah, that's from Nebraska. So that's somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so lots of really cool things. We see these these families. We see bears in Nebraska. We see dogs, and rather than just the true canine subfamily, we have two different other subfamilies of them. Uh, one being. Um, a borophagine dog, which is a bone crushing dog. So here I'll hold up this skull. This, this is a, a, the largest canid that ever lived. It would be about uh, three feet tall, uh, probably, um, you know, about eight feet long. So about waist high for me. Um, is that like a, is that like a dire wolf? This is way, 
way bigger than a dire wolf. This is like a the two compared. This is a, a coyote, and then this is this big oh dog called Epicyon, which is one of the largest bone crushing dogs. Their teeth, as we can tell from their shape, are much more robust mm -hmm. than the wolves and the coyote. So we know they had a big portion of their diet being consuming bone and getting mm. the tissue out inside of that. Um, so this is this is this is the largest of them. And then we had talked about bears. Um, you know, this is a, a cast of a skull of a short-faced bear from the Ice Age. This one's from a site that's about 300,000 years old. This thing would be able to stand on all fours and be six feet tall on its hind limbs. 12 feet and yes. then reach 14. So this is, is, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is, and this is for a comparison. Keep holding up that skull. I want to show you one other bone here just to demonstrate how large that particular bear is. This is the upper arm bone or the humerus of that particular bear. And this is the same bone from a uh, black bear. Wow. And this is from uh, a grizzly bear or a brown bear. So side by side, you can see, I mean, everybody wouldn't want to meet up with a, a grizzly bear if you're out on a hike, right? Just imagine this during the Indian Ice Age. And these were actually around, still alive at the end when humans were first coming over here as part yeah. of that Pleistocene megafauna. So uh, extremely large, long legs suggest fast running. Uh, this was probably one of the apex predators on the landscape during the Ice Age. Um, from right here in Nebraska. So those are a few of them. There's other things like bear dogs, which is an extinct family. We had actually true hyenas living in North America for a short period of time. So, and then we have all the, the weasels, which a lot of them are really cool too. So lots and lots of really cool <laughs> fossil species um, here in Nebraska. I'll show you just one weasel quick and I'll move on because we could talk fossil carnivores for a, for a whole class for a semester if we really wanted to. Um, but I wouldn't sign up for that class. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody get tired of hearing about it. So you can see that little weasel jaw there. That's a lower jaw. This is one that um, Amber, when she was a student here, prepped in our lab upstairs. And there's a, another least weasel jaw of a 500,000 year old uh, least weasel uh, that we have here in the collection next to it. Wow. So we do ever have things from the bears, which are enormous, to the small ones. Each have their own little niche on the landscape. We have fruit eating dogs. So they look like, you know, little coyotes more or less or foxes, mm. but their teeth are adapted for eating fruit. So they mm. eat plums and things like that. They're not very common. They go extinct probably around 6 million years ago, but from 14 to 6, they're, uh, they're, thriving. they're a portion of the, the fauna. So we know just by looking at their teeth, there was probably some different habitats that eventually disappeared, causing them to go extinct. So I, off the record tells us quite a bit. Yeah, I was just gonna say, and Shane, I love how you're you're speaking a lot to you're you're like comparing their their skull and then like speaking to almost ecosystem terms like apex predator and niche and landscape. And and we can tell these things just by studying even like the fossils and the skulls, which is so cool. I wanted to ask you, and either of you can ch chime in on this. What do you? What is a? Let's think about some tiers of carnivores. Like for example, you said apex predator, and I know I've heard of meso carnivore before. Do you want to speak a little bit to like the different types of carnivores that you can have and what role they play in the ecosystem? Either of you can kind of chip away at this one. Yeah, go ahead. Technology question. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you touched on a key word, mesopredator. So, you know, when we think of carnivores, often in the mammal world, we're thinking of the big ones, the cougars, mm -hmm. the black bears, the grizzly bears, the wolves. And those are those apex predators. There's nothing that's preying on those, generally speaking. Right? Okay. So they're the top of the food chain, if you will. And they're, you know, driving the, the, the they're influencing the ecosystem downward. The mesopredators are kind of those in-between those apex predators and the prey species, if you will. So those would be your coyotes, your foxes, um, river otters, uh, you know, generally speaking, they're smaller in size, right? So they kind of fill this medium sized role. So where you've got a wolf or a cougar, for example, that are preying on, you know, in our neck of the woods, white-tailed deer or elk, or even bighorn sheep or cougar in Nebraska, mm -hmm. meso predators are just stepping that down. So they're going after your uh, your small mammals, your squirrels, those types of things. Um, 
uh, Bobcat. I failed to mention Bobcat, another one that fits in there. Um, just kind of steps everything down a level. So in, in a lot of ways, it's still in, in influencing the environment in a similar way, right? Mm -hmm. um, by regulating those smaller prey species. Um, but it's just kind of a scaled down version, I would say, of the apex predator. Uh, I love how both of you talked to about a little bit about the roles that they play in those ecosystem. Um, can we talk just a little bit more about why does an ecosystem need carnivores and what benefits do they provide for the landscape and the ecosystem? Because I always think people get lost and sometimes they see them as almost like a villainous animal. They're not um, always the most loved creature. Yes. They're cool and they're mysterious, but mm -hmm. you're right. They're not the most loved animal. Yeah. What, what would a world look like without carnivores? Maybe ways we're living in one without some level of carnivores but i won't have too much doom and gloom right there's there's many places of the landscape that carnivores have been removed and you know in, in a lot of places especially in the last few decades we're seeing more public support more carnivores coming back but i'll, I'll kind of step back a minute um you know generally speaking the carnivores are in that top level ecosystem role and so they're basically providing balance. They're regulating those herbivores and those prey species, which helps keep the habitat healthy. So mm -hmm. I always like, I try to just, I mean, a very general picture is like a pyramid where you've got your habitat on the ground. That's your your ground, your, your you know, all your plant species, right, mm -hmm. basically. And you've kind of got that middle trophic level, which is your prey species. So let's say deer and, and you know, we can even use squirrels and things like that. But then you've got your predators on top. And so a healthy ecosystem has, you know, a solid base of habitat, mm -hmm. which can support a, you know, by definition, slightly smaller group of herbivores, and then by definition, smaller uh, group of predators. And so you can see these upward pressures as well as these downward pressures. Mm -hmm. If everything is kind of in its place, then you have a healthy ecosystem. But if you take the top off the pyramid, now you don't have that downward pressure anymore. And you can see how the middle of the pyramid gets bigger and bigger, potentially too big, that it doesn't have enough base, and now you have an unhealthy ecosystem. Um, same thing, you know, with the pyramid idea, if you have uh, a, a poor habitat for whatever reason, um, you know, now the smaller, the base gets smaller and the middle gets too big. And again, things are out of balance. So um, there's a lot of particularly particular ways that those influences are exerted, um, which we can get into there. But generally speaking, they keep things in balance. I really love your visual and using your hands. I feel like we should have talked about the whiteboard next time because I was like following the graphics you're creating. That was great. Um, that was a really, that was a really good, like carnivore ecology 101. Yeah. Just really quick. Shane, anything else on that in particular, especially thinking about the, you know, our, our prehistoric times, um, you know, did they play those similar roles? Did it look differently? Do they have different influence on the landscape? A little bit on that, maybe. Yeah, and I, I think, I think he nailed it right on the head. I mean, we're using a lot of what uh, wildlife biologists study today to bring back to the fossil record. So, um, kind of the present is the key to the past. A lot of things, both. Um, that's like one of our big geology things. You know, if we're trying to figure out how these layers of sandstone got here, all we have to do is look at the areas where sandstone is being deposited today, whether it's a river or whatever. Same can be applied to things that wildlife biologists study. And, and you're absolutely right. We need to have that balance. Otherwise, if something gets out of whack, uh, then there's probably going to be an extinction event, right? And so, um, you know, habitats will change. Those animals have to evolve and adapt to that habitat. If they don't, they're going to go extinct. If they're able to adapt, um, then they're they're going to survive. Or a lineage, similar lineage, you know, it might be within the the bone crushing dogs. A different species then takes over that mm -hmm. niche. And so, whenever you have an extinction, a niche opens up for something to come into and kind of fill that role of whatever animal was there before. And so, you know, the same thing that we're seeing today is is happening in the fossil record. So. Um, the only difference is we don't have have humans here to screw it up, right? Everything's kind of in balance on its own. Nature keeps track of everything. Here we're we're throwing humans into the mix. We're taking over those habitats. We're destroying habitats, and we're kind of trying to figure out how can we coexist with mm -hmm. uh, all the animals that are out there um, and still be happy, and make lots of money, like we we want to do, drive fancy cars, all of that stuff. So. <laughs> Um, those are those are problems we are dealing with today that we haven't had in, had to deal with in the fossil 
record or, or have records of for the most part, except at the end of the Pleistocene when uh, you have your big megafaunal extinction. You start to see the introduction of humans into the landscape where they basically, these big apex predators didn't have anybody that could kill them before. Now there's humans here, which are really smart and they have tools and they're starting to hunt them. Um, you know, how did, how did humans start impacting things there? Did it drive species to extinction? Were there other things with the habitat going on that was basically um, going towards their downfall as well? Mm -hmm. And maybe humans just happened to be here at the same time and are getting a bad rap. Maybe it's a combination of both. Uh, you know, we really don't know. That's some portion that we really can't see in the fossil record, but. Yeah, I've yeah. Heard, yeah, I've heard both of those theories, Shane. That's fascinating to think about that our impact even in prehistoric times. Yeah. Um, so now that we've kind of talked a little bit about carnivore 101 and ecology and their role within the ecosystem, let's talk a little bit about like present day and how we monitor and research carnivores today. Um, like any notable research projects, um, especially Randy and or Shane that you are a part of or trends in like carnivore conservation in the Great Plains. Uh, what are you working on or what are you seeing? That kind of stuff. Yeah, so there's a lot, a lot to speak to. Um, there's there's a lot of uh, projects ongoing. Kind of touched on it, I think, in my intro, where you know, for a number of decades, especially in wildlife management, a lot of the attention was on the game species. We studied deer, we studied ducks, we studied pheasants. We've got a pretty good handle on those. You know, their their populations can be doing this or that or the other, but we have a pretty good understanding of what is influencing those. The carnivore world is is different in that they're absent from many places where they were, you know, historically. And I'm talking yeah. just a few hundred years, not to mention millions. <laughs> but um, you know, so on a large scale, including in the Midwest, you're seeing uh, a lot of recolonization. My three species that I deal with, wolves, black bear, and cougar, are three great examples. Uh, really across the country, we're seeing cougar populations rebound. They would have been across the entire lower 48 states 100 years ago, mm -hmm. and they were largely, you know, reduced to the mountainous areas of the West. And over the last 50 years or so, from a number of changes, but they've expanded back east, all the way into Nebraska, and even places like Wisconsin, we're getting individual cougars popping up all the time anymore. Um, black bear is a similar story. They would have been largely across the country. They were reduced during European settlement. They got protections. They're starting to expand back out. So there's a number of states down south that are having growing black bear populations. And, and you know, there's challenges that come along with that, obviously. But we're starting to see them all come back. Wolves, similar thing. Uh, maybe not to the extent because there's a lot more human interest, I guess we'll call it, in wolves. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, their populations are rebounding, especially from where they were just a while ago. And a lot of that's due to research, right? We have to learn... Uh, what kind of habitats do they need? What kind of prey do they need? How do they interact with each other on the landscape? Um, so a lot of, a lot of, I have one more prop here. A lot of work revolves around these things right here. So this is a version of a radio collar. This is what we're putting out on wolves currently. And it's, it's a GPS radio collar. So um, basically it's like a handheld GPS or like your phone really that the animal is wearing. It's recording locations. Those locations are being sent to a satellite. The satellite sends it down to our computer. So we get you know, location information, we get survival information. So how long does that animal live? And, and then if it does die, what's killing it? Mm -hmm. um, and so those are like some key ingredients that really help us, whether it's bears or cougars or wolves or any species that help us understand what does this animal need? Uh, what's you know, what's causing this, this species to do well or what's causing the species to not do so well. So I'll wrap it up with the, uh, Nebraska's got some really cool research going on with cougars. They've been doing it for at least a decade, I think, with its three parts. It's, it's these guys, these GPS collars. They've also done some trail camera work. So trail cameras, we almost take them for granted today <laughs> in wildlife research, but even 15 years ago, trail cameras were nothing. Like they were still film and mm, mm -hmm. how you can have thousands of pictures on a camera, high resolution. They're even satellite you know, or, or uh, cellular so they can send pictures right away. Um, the third component, which I think is really cool is 
uh, Nebraska has used uh, scat detection dogs. So there are companies out there or, or groups that have dogs that are trained up to sniff out specifically cougar scat. And so they've done work out across the landscape, mm -hmm. sniffing out, collecting cougar scat, they get genetics out of that and it gives them all kinds of good information. Yeah, and um, on that note, Randy, especially with the caller, it, it seems like we're um, between Nebraska and Wisconsin, we're starting to swap some carnivores. We're getting some of your wolves down here. In the last year, we've had a few incidents, and then um, you said something about one of our cougars or that had a collar on. Can, can you speak to that? The our fun carnivore swap we're doing because you know carnivores really like to pay attention to geopolitical lines, so they definitely like check in, you know, before. Really, yeah, they check the maps a mm -hmm. lot. No, it's one of the keys of carnivores. Typically, uh, especially the large carnivores, they're really good at what we call dispersal, which means yeah. when an animal is growing up, you know, I call them teenagers, but they get kicked out of home and they go explore. And sometimes they explore 10 miles down the road and they set up shop there. The next one walks 100 or 200 or 300 miles. Uh, we're seeing that with bears. We're seeing it with wolves. So we have a very healthy wolf population in Wisconsin. And we have individuals that take off into pretty much name your state and they'll show up, including Nebraska. You guys better mm -hmm. have show up. Um, on the same side, we've got cougars out west, including in Nebraska, and those cats, again, really uh, capable of dispersing long distances. And so in Wisconsin, we don't have a breeding population of cougars. We've mm -hmm. never documented a female. We've never documented kittens, but we document several individuals every year. And further, we, we get a picture of them here in space, and then a few days, a few days later, we get a picture of them over here, which is 30 miles away. Yeah. So uh, we get genetics whenever we can, and, and often, in fact, every single time, I think, so far, the genetics have pointed back to the Black Hills or Nebraska, the yeah. Western populations. That's cool. Well, you're welcome for those. <laughs> Keep them coming. Yeah. I, I forgot to mention, yes, you, I, in the news recently, there was a cougar that was hit and killed on the road uh, in northern Illinois. And in that press release, they shared that they were also tracking a lot, another, a second cougar that was wearing a collar from Nebraska. And it was in Illinois somewhere. The states were talking and that's about as much as I know, but yeah. it just goes to show these cats can cover incredible ground. Yeah, maybe that's what, maybe that's the kind of ground like they covered, you know, historically when there wasn't those kind of like the set yeah. geopolitical lines and, and things like that. So that's fascinating. What I'll about- just yeah, go ahead. Oh, and one more anecdote. The, the farthest one that I'm aware of is a cougar that started in the Black Hills and dispersed all through the Great Lakes, including in Wisconsin, ended up being killed by a car in Connecticut. I use that example all the time when I heard it? that. I was I could not believe it walked all the way from South Dakota to Connecticut. That's crazy. Can you yeah. imagine like following that path? Like just right? going on that. You're just path. going. Yeah. That's incredible. That's um, so cool. if anyone's interested, and I can put this in the evaluations and resources too, there's a really good book that um Sam actually talked about. It's called The Beast in the Garden. And it's about the kind of the reintroduction of mountain lions coming back in. It's actually based in Colorado. It's a true story. It talks about mountain lions kind of coming back and like people's um, reactions to mountain lions and stuff like that. So it'd be a really good book if anyone's interested in reading that. I can put it in the um, evaluation. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. It's actually. an alluring title. It is. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's good. Uh, excellent. Um, Shane, what about in your area, you know, as far as research on prehistoric carnivores, um, what's happening with that? Is there any like big special project happening right now in Nebraska? Um, you know, I mean, we're always, we're always trying to research and figure out what species are present. Anytime, you know, carnivores are rare to begin with, you know, mm -hmm. from finding all the herbivores, they're way more common. We find tons of horse teeth. So when you find a carnivore, you want to figure out where it goes. So, yeah, I mean, there's some, some occurrences. A lot of times carnivores are actually um, immigrants from Asia, and we use those as markers for time frames. Like mm -hmm. this species shows up, we know we're at the eight million year old time frame. Uh, we do that with a couple different genus of bear, uh, a different genera of bear. Uh, when one shows up, we know we're here at eight million. When another one shows up, we know we're somewhere around six million. And so we're we're constantly doing things like that. Um, you know, just recently. Uh, when I was out monitoring some construction projects, stopped by a, a gravel pit and 
one of the first bones there that I found was um, an, an arm bone or the ulna, the uh, smaller of the forearm bones from a, from a brown bear. They also mm. had a uh, brown bear jaw that they had. I think those are maybe the fourth and fifth occurrences of um, prehistoric uh, brown bear in the fossil record. Uh, had another gentleman a couple years ago during COVID had found a bunch of bones in the 1980s when he was doing road construction projects. And he gave these to me and they sat in a box and one of uh, my lab assistants was cleaning them off earlier this year. And when I went to try to figure out what it was, you know, I, at first I thought, well, maybe it's a small elephant, maybe it's a sloth. Oh, that's exciting. When it didn't match up with either of them, it was like, what else is there in that size range? And it's like, well, is it a carnivore? And it ended up being one of those short faced bear. And he has a string of vertebrae that we were able to compare then directly with the, um, the living uh, brown bears and, and see that, yeah, this is basically the same thing. So this is a uh, rare occurrence in Nebraska. It's from an area where we don't have very many fossils to begin with. And we have part of a pelvis, uh, part of a femur, and then a bunch of the uh, the vertebrae there. And I went out looking for more. It was a, you know, search for the needle in the haystack sort of thing, but um, just how many of them and which ones were connected, I think the whole skeleton had been there if uh, had been recognized at that point. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm- How many, how many million years ago would have that, would have That been? one would have been around probably um, somewhere between 12 and 24,000 years ago, <laughs> that short face bear. So that one's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, another project that, you know, I have uh, kind of going on out in Western Nebraska, we found partial skeleton of a, of a lion. Um, so a, basically an African lion that was around here on the landscape. We got a partial skeleton to that. So we've been looking at that. If we study the bones, all bones have a story to them. Here's the, here's the same, it's basically the same size. This is the same bone in an African lion. So you can see they're, wow. they're the yeah. exact same size. Wow. But if we look at the bottom, this little process down here in the lion is actually broken off on the fossil one. Now, did it just happen to break? That's and down on the bottom end. There's actually a couple little holes down here. And if we look at those holes, they fit up perfectly with the teeth from the bone crushing dog. And so those will fit in there exactly. So uh, this lion probably did not get killed by this bone crushing dog, which was the size of a wolf, but it probably had died. And just like dogs do today, some bones um, with bone crushing dogs, they probably had a substantial portion of their diet um, from bone, bone matter. So they're probably just feeding on this uh, skeleton that was laying there on the landscape. Um, it's incredible then, the stories you can weave Shane from just like, it's like your whole job is putting together puzzles. Yeah. And then yeah, telling sure. the stories like that's so sure, It's like a, a crime scene investigation, no kidding, you know, yeah. and you're trying to, to figure out how did this bone end up here? Did it die natural causes? Uh, once you start looking at all the details, there's a whole nother field within paleontology called taphonomy, which is basically everything that occurred from the time the animal died until it was dug up. And Wait, what so, was that called? I have, I have to write that down. Uh, taphonomy, T-A-P-H-O-N-O-M-Y. And so that would include things like this is a horse arm bone, but if we look really close at it, we can see there's a hole right there and that's a bite mark. And if we flip it over, we can see uh, a matching bite mark on the other side. So when those carnivores are using those teeth between the upper and lower jaw, and if you have like a big sagittal crest, like Randy showed us on the wolf with those muscles, the bigger that sagittal crest is, more muscle, it means more power and bite force, then it can puncture those and leave basically its marks behind. And so uh, there's cool things like that. There's a, a bear dog that we found in a burrow that uh, myself and uh, one of the other researchers here are going to look at. Um, there's a lot of new species in there. It just takes time to figure out because they are so rare. Um, they might be just found here in Nebraska or at one or two other spots. There's a, um, a mustelid called Zodia lestes, which lived 20 to 23 million years ago. And one of the first, the description of the first species was actually out of a burrow of one of these burrowing beavers. It had died mm -hmm. in the burrow and we had a whole skeleton. So we know that there was a predator prey yes. relationship between those two, uh, mm -hmm. basically documented by that. And um, that was the only skull 
or partial skeleton from Nebraska. There's a couple over in Wyoming, but at one of my sites on the highway project, I found a skull to one of those as well. So it'll be interesting to see that completely intact and maybe look at kind of the ear region to see. Some people think they're more closely related to raccoon family members, other think weasels. So it'll be interesting to kind of look at that and determine where it does fall out. Um, yeah, Nebraska is just popping. Yeah, so yeah look with at that. scientific it's like, research. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, lots of endless projects. So cool. Yeah, and also I just have to say, like, we've been doing this for almost two years now, Monica. I hope you know that. Mm -hmm. Is that incredible? It is. Yeah. And still to this day, every single time I learn something brand new. Yeah. That is the best part. Yeah. Like, I can't believe we're at work. Also, didn't you live in Western Nebraska I did. at one point? Can yeah. you imagine seeing one of those like lions? Just, I, like, no, I can't. And... No, it's, it would be amazing. <laughs> when I lived in Western Nebraska, um, Shane and I put on a paleontology camp for kids together. It was so cool. So I got Can to we do one of those for adults. Yes. Cool. Okay. We should talk about that. That's for 2023. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's, we have about 50, 20 minutes left. We have a few really good questions left and questions from the audience. Yeah. What's next? Um, good. Let's talk a little bit about some of the, the problems and the threats maybe that carnivores face today. Um, we talked a little bit about the um, kind of people, you know, they've been removed. They're the villainous animals sometimes to a lot of people, but what, um, is it just like a PR problem? Like what's their biggest yeah. challenge? Do we have any threatened and endangered carnivores in the Great Plains or in Nebraska specifically? And what challenges do they face today? Where to start? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of questions uh, in that question. Yeah, so, well, it's maybe worth pointing out right away that like, uh, just a couple of hundred years ago, there would have been grizzly bears, which are not present anymore. Mm -hmm. There would have been black bears, I think largely in the eastern parts where it's more forested. Mm -hmm. uh, largely not present anymore, except occasional bears that wander through. Uh, cougars would have been across the state. They're back, but still in relatively you know, localized areas. Mm -hmm. um, and then wolves would have been across the state, also pretty much gone with the exception of a few. So um, kind of putting that into context, uh, you know, there's, Similar stories have played out all across the United States, basically, as, as European colonization was occurring, you know, they viewed predators as a threat, right? A threat to killing wild game, which was feeding our families, a threat to safety, a threat to livestock, all those things. And so a lot of that is what drove those populations down. And then what usually followed was a lot of habitat change. In the mm -hmm. east, it was a lot of deforestation. In the plains, it's a lot of... Uh, plowing up the prairie into agriculture, um, as well as fences. Fences have some level of impact as well. Um, fast forward to today, you know, we've obviously changed a lot of our perspectives. And, and one of the overarching things that we see in the carnivore world is public attitudes for, uh, or towards, I should say, carnivores continue to slowly increase. Mm. The public is slowly but surely, I think, and a lot of it's driven by science, right? If we don't know the, the benefits, we only see the negatives, right? You're going to have a negative view. But a lot of these benefits are subtle and even more so, they take a long time, right? When, when a carnivore is removed from a system, often it can take decades before you really see any real impacts. I mean, for example, we're talking about forest regeneration, right? Forest regeneration is several people's lifetimes mm -hmm. to actually see a real change. And so... Nevertheless, people we're, we're learning more, attitudes are changing, um, and so you see growing support. Nonetheless, probably the biggest threat is still just that lack of public support. Mm -hmm. That's you know fear of being attacked, it's fear of livestock, it's often uh, you know wolves are going to kill all the deer or all the elk or cougar. I mean, insert your your critter, right? Um, a lot of it is just based in misperception and uh, honestly, some fairy tales, right? I, I like to use the example in, in my world of, of bears and wolves. We have a lot of both in Wisconsin and we've done public attitude surveys that show that more people are negatively affected by bears in the state through trash cans, through mm -hmm. bird feeders, all those things, and yet high levels of public support. Everybody loves bears, right? I mean, who doesn't love bears? Um, the flip side of that is wolves. Wolves have growing public support, but they're very controversial. And often people will say you either love them or hate them. 
I think there's a lot of people in between. But nonetheless, we don't see unanimous public support for wolves like we do for bears. And then you start to think, well, why might that be? And, you know, going back to our childhoods, right? When you're reading the the Grimm brothers, man. Right. Little Red Riding Hood. She's, Mm -hmm. she's, you know, in fear of a wolf. Um, At the same time, you've got Yogi Bear. You've got uh, Winnie the Pooh. You've got, uh, who's the, the the Smokey, Smokey the Bear, right? I mean, Peter the Wolf, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's just all these examples of just, I think it's a cultural thing, right? Where you just have positive views towards one animal, a bear is just a big bumbling, happy character, and then the wolf is a bad thing, right? Mm-hmm. And there's there's all of these instances where you see this dichotomy. Mm-hmm. And I think that continues to play out for a lifetime, uh, including today. Right. Um, so with protection, with public support, carnivores are more than happy to make a living in the landscapes of today. In most cases, there's prey on the ground, there's habitat that's available. It's, it largely comes down to public support. Where are we uh, willing to coexist alongside of these animals? Yeah, and I, mean, I feel like it also takes that kind of more systematic thinking approach. You know, that ecological literacy and like what you said, just removing them now, it's going to have impacts way down the road. And if we have if we have that kind of understanding and knowledge to think in that way of how things impact the ecosystem. Also, I think um, maybe programs like this help. Yeah, you know, yeah, getting absolutely. That public support. We've either got well, we got fifty people right now on that are interested in carnivores, and yeah. there's fifty more people that can. Mm-hmm. show their support for carnivore. Maybe we can start rewriting some fairy tales so it's a little less right? Some... Right. Another yep. 2023 goal. Okay, let's do it. Okay. That's it's awesome. really pervasive too because I, you know, in my world, I, I really try to be careful not to oversell either. Yeah. Right? Uh, carnivores are, are an important part of the ecosystem, but there's even some scientific literature out there that is really probably overselling the impacts, right? And so it's important to just put these carnivores in their place as an important uh, component of a healthy ecosystem, mm-hmm. but they're not necessarily the, the saviors of the world either, right? Yeah. And, and Yellowstone's a great example. Uh, when wolves were reintroduced in Yellowstone, there was a lot of uh, trickle-down effects all through the ecosystem, and a lot of it was really over uh, overstated. Um, they're still important, but it kind of comes back to this whole idea that all of these ecosystems are really complex. Mm-hmm. And then you sprinkle in humans, <laughs> as Shane pointed out, like you, you enter humans and all of our impacts and some of these things get really complicated really quickly. So important piece, but also, uh, you know, just a, a dose of reality, I think is important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. Um, and speaking of that, this is one of the good, this is one of the questions, I think this is kind of pertaining to one of our guest questions yeah, too, yeah. but um, how have carnivores adapted or not adapted to human impact um, on the larger landscapes of the Great Plains? I mean, I think you're just speaking to that a little bit, but maybe specifically something that we've been um, hearing and seeing and discussing a lot in our world of wildlife education, specifically in Eastern Nebraska, is the idea of urban wildlife or urban carnivores and those mesopredators that are found in urban spaces. And I know that some are adapting better than others. Um, maybe speak a little bit to urban carnivores. Do they have a role in those habitats? Are they as scary as people think? Um, maybe speak a little bit to that if you can. Is that okay? Yeah. We can easily do a whole show on just I urban know. wildlife. Like I that's know. Great we should do that. We, yeah, yeah. So in Nebraska, urban wildlife is going to be deer, it's going to be coyotes, it's going to be fox, it's going to be raccoons. A lot of those meso predators that we talked mm-hmm. about earlier and deer. And so a lot of those species are also really adaptable species. So on the whole, carnivores are quite adaptable. Mm-hmm. Um, black bears, they eat literally almost anything. They can live amongst people. They can live in total wilderness. They can live in you know deep, dark forests all the way out to like agricultural fields. Wolves are the same way. Wolves have, wolves currently live everywhere from the Arctic to the forested areas of the Great Lakes, to open fields in Montana and the mountains and and those areas. So carnivores on the whole are really adaptable as long as there's food and as long as they can catch it. Um, So yeah, it's adapting to the human presence that 
that's you know today's challenge. Um, and that can be everything from roads to uh, cities expanding, those types of things. And then obviously like the impacts that, you know, if people don't like them and they're killing them illegally or those mm -hmm. types of things. But um, generally speaking, these carnivore species are quite adaptable and capable of living right alongside people in today's world um, if we're willing to, to let them. Yeah, just part of our nature neighbors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> We'll do this last one and then lightning round. Yeah, so okay. we have one more question. <clears throat> and then like Amber mentioned, we're going to go, um, when people registered, they had the option to write a question in. Um, we so we'll get through ones. them. Yeah, we have a lot too. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure we get to those. But kind of like one of the things we like to end all of our Nature Nerd Night stuff with is, why should we care about the topic at hand? So um, <clears throat> Shane and Randy, why should we care about carnivores? Randy, you kind of mentioned all the complex ecosystem benefits and the way that they fit in a little bit, but really drive home what's what's the point why do we need carnivores and why should we care if you are a carnivore publicist yeah well i think we're still trying to find just the right message but uh i mean a lot of it is just it's a healthy it's an important component of that healthy ecosystem why do why do i care about that i think it's because you know we want to leave a legacy of a healthy ecosystem for all the people that come behind us mm -hmm. right a hundred years ago they were doing the opposite and mm -hmm. we're still trying to sort that out so our legacy 100 years from now can be, you know, sorting all that out. I think that's really important. Like and that. there's I've probably a lot more like that. that. There, there's a lot more that we probably don't know. Oh, I like that. I like that Mike attitude dropped. a lot. Yeah, Mike, Mike dropped. dropped. That was a good one, Randy. That's good. Shane, anything to add on that? And then it may be specifically why should people care about carnivores, but why, especially in your world, why is it still important to study the, the past, to study prehistory like that? Yeah, I think... Time? I think, you know, there's a lot of species uh, in the past, you know, fortunately, we can see things living today. We know exactly how many are there in the fossil record. We're probably underrepresented um, just because not everything that lived gets preserved. It has to be in the right environment and things like that. So there's a lot of questions that way. But to kind of follow up on it, on it, you know, from my perspective, you know, extinction is forever. You know, once you wipe these animals out, you can't get another one back. So, you know, um, so figuring out a way that we can coexist with it. I have tons of fossils on the table that went uh, extinct naturally, uh, just based on, you know, changes in landscape or changes in temperature, things like that, or maybe something out competing them. Mm -hmm. But um, here in the modern day system, you know, it's extinctions usually driven by those things, but then the pressure of humans as well. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't want to, we don't want to have these animals over here thousands of years go extinct for no reason at all. So, yeah, that's good. Those were good answers. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like both mic drop <laughs> answers. <laughs> Fantastic. Extinction is forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And we don't know everything. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Those are my favorite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Takeaway. <laughs> yeah. All right, lightning round. Are we ready for this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so um, we got a lot of really great great questions. I'll try to get through um, most of them in the last five, six-ish minutes. Yeah. Um, we'll start off with a light one. Are you ready for this? How has it changed in the last few years because of climate change? Just a really quick, like a little answer for that one. But um, climate change impact on predators. And and maybe in um, how did climate affect predators um, Prehistorically, Shane. Who wants it? I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. I, I think it's going to be a slow change. I don't know if there's been any immediate impacts right off the bat. Um, it's probably going to impact habitat, which will impact prey, which will then impact carnivores. You'll That's go up your triangle. That makes sense. My, yeah, <laughs> my short mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. um, Someone in the chat had a really good question. And I, uh, this is kind of back to what you were talking about, Randy, with the radio collars. Has there been any research done about how those collars kind of affect the organisms or if it changes their behavior, or if you notice anything different once the collars are on versus when they're off? That's a good question. That's like, it's paramount, right? To obviously make sure that the animal, the individual is healthy and that this thing is not negatively impacting them for two reasons. One, obviously animal welfare. We want to Take care of these animals but two if the way that we're studying them is negatively affecting them we're going to get negative bias in our results so 
we take every precaution that you can with those collars. There's guidelines on how much they should weigh, what size they should be, all of those things in every effort to reduce you know, how it affects that animal going forward. So generally speaking, uh, they go right back to doing what they're doing. Okay, that's good. Um, maybe this one's a little, maybe more for you, Shane. Any research data or data on connection between historical predators and today's predators? I mean, I know you spoke to it, but is there anything that stands out between what used to be here, but is still here and pretty strong? Um, you know, I, I guess maybe I'll just say that some of the relationships uh, between predator and prey that have been going on, um, you know, today we're going on in the past too. I mean, a lot of times where we find um, prey dogs in the fossil record during the ice age, we also find uh, black-footed ferret as well in the same horizon. So we know those relationships were going on for extremely long periods of time. So, I mean, it's not something like one day somebody says, hey, this prey dog tastes pretty good. Why don't you try it? You know, I mean, they're kind of like we were saying before, there's kind of that niche or certain things that these animals like to feed. I think same thing can be said probably uh, results with, um, you know, coyotes and like voles and things like that. If we found fossil coyote scat, we could dissect it, look to see exactly what they're eating. And basically they're going to be eating the same things in the past that they are today, especially when we're talking about things during the ice age, these uh, really close relationships to, or timeframes to today. Hmm. And Shane, you mentioned earlier that you just mentioned scat, and you also did you show the coprolite? I, I didn't. That's another thing. Oh, that I, really I, I really want to see this again. It's my dream yeah, to find so, coprolite in the wild. So yeah. So this is right. this is fossil dog poop from Asheville fossil beds. So it's twelve million years ago. It's bone crushing dog scat. If we take measurements on it, it's the exact same size uh, that we'd see in a wolf today. So wow. roughly how big they are and what i'm dying to do is do a ct scan and see how loaded this is with bone now we can go back into the 30 million year old range and we can find copper lights in those layers of rock and we can actually see mice jaws so we know which predators based on the size and we can tell exactly which species they were preying on that far back and so scat which is why it's not a, a body fossil it's a trace fossil uh, gives us a lot of evidence into maybe some of these biologic interactions between species. And so that's just one example. We probably have uh, 15 to 30 of them from Asheville. Wow. Um, they're not super common. We don't find a lot with herbivores for obvious reasons because the carnivores chew up all the bones. So they're loaded with bones. So they have a better chance to survive. So pretty cool stuff that way. I love that you can, uh, you can investigate prehistoric scat. Yeah and learn about the ecosystem. And it looks just like dog poop it today. Totally does. Like if you, sure. my kid eats a lot of powdered donuts, like if you would just roll it in the powder, I'm sorry. <laughs> it looks like a powdered donut dog poop. Yeah. Like it, no, okay. that's perfect. Sorry. I have three mm -hmm. dogs, so I'm really intimately familiar yes. with what they look like. Exactly. So that was, that's a lot too. Um, we have one last question mm -hmm. for you. Um, and this is like a, just a quick fun one. What is your favorite carnivore past or present and why? Yeah. All right, well, mine's gonna be Barbara Felis. Uh, this skull here. He's ready for this one. quick. I mean, this is the only skull of this thing that's ever been found. This is on my list, you know. Did you say it was the only one two. ever been found? This is the only skull of this species ever been found. It was found like in, in Nebraska or ever? Anywhere in the world, oh. anywhere in North America, right? So this is a lion sized thing. We have the skull, lower jaw. Um, we have, uh, I think, a limb bone. We have the shin bone. And uh, there might be a thigh bone of this large thing from another site. So it's extremely rare. And um, this is the one thing that, you know, on my list of things, I hope I find before I'm done, but I hope I would find one of these things, just add more knowledge because each piece is, is another piece of data that's out there, right? Maybe this guy didn't have this tooth, but, you know, maybe this is just the exception, you know, kind of like on some of these mm -hmm. fossil deer, you know, deer, if you look at their antlers, they can be all weird shapes today. We name, mm -hmm. we see something with a new uh, new horn or an antler, we'll call it a new species. Well, maybe that's just something that got rubbed wrong when it was forming and it's a deformed uh, horn or antler. So having more data points helps you mm -hmm. learn more about what the species looks like totally. Was there dimorphism where males bigger than females? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Those other 
stories or 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 things we can learn about those ancient species. So that'd be my favorite. Barbara. What, what species did you say that was, Shane? Because I want to write it down. Um, it, it's Barbarophilus fricki. So Barbour's cat. It was named for the museum director. Mm -hmm. They found that skull three weeks, two or three weeks after he died. And so, uh, so Barbour's cat, and then the species name was named after uh, a guy out of the American Museum that donated a bunch of money and paid a bunch of crews to look for fossils so Incredible. yeah it's an extremely rare individual eight million years and from nebraska wow amazing yeah and i think is that the same um species if you go to moral hall on the fourth Where floor you the job you do the little crank job exactly yep. yeah and it just shows how much it opens how far yeah, it can so open yep. you'll see that yeah all right randy favorite carnivore be the same because that's really cool <laughs> no no kidding <laughs> like that's my new favorite <laughs> uh, I think I have to go with cougar, so I'm just going to share my little prop here. That's again, I, I uh, this is from my graduate work in Western North Dakota. So a landscape very similar to a lot of Nebraska, and mm -hmm. I think this picture just really, I don't know, it strikes me as it's so cool to know that that critter is out in the landscape. I, I have a camera here, and I had pictures of everything from deer to elk to people hiking to mm -hmm. horseback riding. Everything was walking down this same trail, and here's this guy doing the same thing. And it just kind of, you know, these guys are living out in that space, and they make their living by themselves with nothing more than their claws and their teeth. And mm -hmm. to me, that just, I don't know, speaks volumes to how cool those critters are. But again, also kind of come back to that idea of, of what else about these things and the influences that they have that you know, that we have yet to figure out. And, yeah. and that just kind of summarizes all in my brain. And, and uh, yeah, I think that's why they're my favorite. Randy, you're like a carnivore um, philo philo philosopher. Oh my God. Philosopher. Philosopher. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I just got so upset. You're like a carnivore philosopher. Uh, just a philosopher. Like, <laughs> yes, I can't. You can probably relate when you, when you spend all your time out in the middle of nowhere by yourself so trying great. to study these things. You have a lot of time to think. I know. I yeah. really appreciate it. <laughs> So cool. This is a great way to end. I know. I think so too. Cool and, episode. and this yes. being our last one too. So um, thank you yeah. so much for sharing all this. And um, we learned a lot tonight. Yeah. And if you missed it, uh, well, clearly you didn't miss it because you're here. But if you had someone that missed it or would like to share this uh, or watch it again, we will post it on our Game of Parks Education YouTube channel um, probably tomorrow sometime. And then we will also send everyone that was registered tonight some resources. And um, if Shane and Randy are okay with it, we can also share your contact information if there's any more questions or anything um and then this wraps up nebraska nature also Nine. can i just say yeah. how much i loved our last one it was basically like this adorable show and tell yes because we're all nature nerds yeah, yeah. This was like i always it's like amazing. the props though yeah yeah it's fantastic yeah. Awesome. well thank, thank you, you so much yeah thank you shane and randy very much for joining us tonight and uh thanks to all of our participants and um we'll see you next year yeah see you next year all thank right. you everyone bye